this webinar based on a lot of feedback that we were getting uh, from the participants uh, in this uh, the project. And uh, we went, a couple of issues came up that um, uh, we thought were really critically, critically important to address uh, so that this whole uh, effort around using the decision support tool of PracticeWise and the MAP system would really be uh, used in the most optimal way. So let's just let's get started with the program. We're going to be ending exactly at um, at one o'clock, <clears throat> and so let's let's without further ado, let's go to the agenda. So we're going to um, be examining the key challenges in treating depression, and the two issues that had come up, and this was really feedback from many of the participants, that many of the clients are in have really complex clinical issues. No one just comes in with sort of very straightforward, you know, few symptoms of depression, and that's it. The other is something called COWS, which are really the crises of the week. Uh, so that was another, uh, you know, challenge, uh, is that when there are some urgent or immediate situations to address. We are, uh, you know, you have a treat today because we have also have one of our participants, uh, Melissa, uh, who will be uh, sharing with you um, their use of the MAP system and uh, an actual dashboard that they have, you know, completed. Uh, so you, she'll be able to run through some of the decision steps uh, around how to use uh, a, a dashboard approach uh, to improve really treatment outcomes. Uh, then, of course, the issue around therapeutic alliance is always key, uh, running throughout uh, every aspect of, uh, of treatment. Then we're going to go into some of the key depression practice elements uh, that we haven't really focused on before. We, we went through a number of them in our previous webinars. In this webinar, we're going to focus on three areas, problem solving, goal setting, and maintenance. And then we'll share some of our next steps since we're coming to the end of the first quarter uh, that's focused on depression. And then any uh, questions that uh, folks have. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so key, key challenges in treating uh, depression. Complex clinical conditions and these crises uh, that come up during the session. So what do we mean by complex clinical conditions? Uh, so what does it mean? Bottom line, um, when there are multiple clinical problems, it's not uncommon for, uh, for us to hear that in, in actual day-to-day -day practice that a client has uh, symptoms of depression and uh, anxiety and some trauma-related types of, of symptoms, uh, some conduct problems, a whole host of, of difficulties uh, that makes it really challenge, challenging for a practitioner, uh, even in deciding what's the, the overall treatment plan. If there are some multiple difficulties, where do I even begin? Uh, other com complexities that are encountered in the clinical uh, process are caregiver mental health or substance use issues. So you think, okay, we're working on the kid, but also the caregiver here, who needs to be an integral part of the treatment, also is struggling with a number of mental health and substance use problems and what to do. Then there are the toxic life conditions, and all of you who are on this webinar know full well that there are many, many challenges. So for some of the youngsters that you're working with, they're also dealing with homelessness. There may be some domestic violence at home, or they're in neighborhoods where violence is commonplace. Poverty, everywhere from you know basic sort of like ne neglect to food insufficiency, um, to again all the all the stresses that come uh, living in a poverty situation, uh, the financial crises that occur, physical health problems either for the child or for caregivers. Uh, whether there's been major losses, you know, in the family. And if, if I asked you to just continue listing, you'd have no problem continuing to list other toxic life conditions. So we have a, just a, a poll question just want to throw out to you. So when you really think of the clients that you serve, um, and, and maybe, you know, we, there are some of these more direct uh, kind of circumscribed clinical problems, but how many of your clients would you say, yeah, you know what, they, they really do fall into this sort of complex clinical picture. Uh, would you say all of them, most, some, very few, or none of them? Let's just, let's get a little barometer on, on the, how relevant this topic is to all of you on the phone. So please just check off one of those boxes. Okay, Evelyn, how are we doing?
Just another moment. Uh, Evelyn, are we uh, folks? That, okay, great. Um, okay, so we, we clearly we see that, um, you know, this is, this is a very relevant issue, that is few clients who really, uh, you know, kind of fall within sort of a more simple, direct kind of like clinical picture. Uh, and, and in public mental health, and most of you are involved, and if not all of you, uh, this is not uncommon. Okay, so we know that we're on the right track uh, in, in addressing this issue. So why is this, uh, and what, what is this challenge associated? Well, the first thing is, you know, how the heck do you stay on track and stay focused in the, com in the context of this complexity? You can just go from one issue, one stress, one difficulty to another. Uh, so that's, that's one of the issues. And as you know, one principle around effective treatment is being able to provide enough dosage and duration, duration of an intervention that is likely to help. But it's not so, uh, it's quite actually quite easy to get off track in terms of addressing the key clinical problems that brings this kid to treatment. Another challenge is, okay, where do I begin? What should I, uh, what should I address first? How do I make that decision? I got all sorts of difficulties going on. There's toxic, toxic stressors. There's complex clinical problems. Uh, and uh, so where do I actually begin is a key question that I'm sure all of you uh, have encountered. And so we want to just share some thoughts that may be useful to you in, in making that decision. And what are some ways that you do this uh, currently as, as clinician? So if you have some thoughts on uh, how do you uh, choose or how do you decide where to begin? Uh, if you have some thoughts on that, so if I were a clinician and I came to you and I said, hey, I have a kid with all these difficult anxiety and depression, he has conduct problems, uh, he also has some symptoms related to PTSD, and, and, and there's also some, uh, you know, obsessive compulsive features, uh, you know, around this and all those sorts of things, um, and I, I don't know where to begin. What what suggestion might you have for me? What what would be something I ought to consider in deciding, you know, where to begin? So please just type in any thoughts that you have, you know, related to this. Let's see if if anyone is having a chance to um, to chime in. Okay, we're having some responses. So what does that say? Uh, Address safety uh, Cara, issues. Kara's right next to me here, Kara. Address safety issues first, such as any suicidality, homicidal ideation. Okay, so the suggestion to me is, hey, Tony, the first thing you got to do is really look at risk and take a look at anything that really would compromise safety. Okay, that makes perfect sense to me. Any other Any other thoughts that ought to... I ought to consider as I make a decision of where to begin. Okay. Well, I think that, you know, I think that probably others on the line are saying that's the place to begin, <laughs> you know, the issue of like safety. But there are other considerations as well and wanted to share that with you. So some has to do with safety, and you may decide, gee, I don't think uh, there's, Anything that really strikes me in in terms of uh, of risk. Uh, actually, we have someone else who who just sort of typed in a, a an issue. Let's just see, hear what they have to say. After assessing risk, I usually begin with a formal trauma assessment to determine if traumatic response is the root of the symptoms. Okay, so one issue is you might say, look, maybe you're getting all these multiple types of problems, but consider the root cause. You know, maybe these are all just branches uh, related to a core, you know, life difficulty, and in this case. Uh, or to consider trauma as sort of the root to a number of these problems. That makes perfect sense. You can see that as we get, if we had more time on this, we would certainly begin to see how more complex this can be. So in addition to that, the issue around urgency, like what is most, most immediate, and that may be related to security and, and safety issues. The other is you can certainly begin, if there aren't these strong safety and urgency issues, you may decide to focus on a problem which the family strengths can be utilized. So you say, you know what, there's a bunch of things going on here. Uh, I want to really help in a, and see some success. 
And I don't want to go in the area where the family uh, may have the most deficits. Let me consider beginning where there are most strengths. That would be a perfectly rational thing to do. Another consideration would be, so what areas align with the felt need of the child or caregiver? Where am I most likely to get endorsement from the child and or caregiver? In other words, this would align with their felt need. So I may, may decide that, you know what, I want to keep these folks engaged. I don't want to be misaligned with what they experience as the high felt need. So I may decide to go in that direction. You know, there's four or five different issues we can tackle. Maybe I'll tackle the one that the family and the child uh, are, are most uh, connected to and would most like to see some change. So that I think that would be also a rational approach. Another approach would be where are you likely to get an early win? You know, in many cases, both the caregiver and the child may be saying, well, you know, what, what's in this for me? You know, what is this going to work? What does it mean to work? And, you know, it's hard for people to kind of anticipate that, well, maybe months down the road we're going to start seeing some benefit. So you may decide what area am I most likely to get like an early win, a positive benefit that, again, strengthens the therapeutic alliance and builds the confidence that the family has in you as a practitioner. Sometimes you may choose to begin where you have the most information to develop a plan. You know, you say, look, I need to keep gathering more and more information before I decide, you know, what direction I'm going to go in. But there is some information I already have, and I may want to focus on a plan, at least initially, where I have at least most information. And so I'm not, I'm not just moving in a sort of like, you know, in a, in a, in a dark, you know, where I'm kind of in the dark in terms of I don't have enough information uh, to, to address this, that, or the other issue. So, and I'm sure if we spent a little more time, you guys could come up with some additional issues. But when you're dealing with complexity, that's one of the challenges is where do I begin? And it has implications for the use of the practice-wise system, which, um, in, in, you know, most studies, and, and one has to just be re recognize this, in most studies, uh, you often don't want uh, to include uh, children uh, as subjects in the study where there's too much complexity because, you know, it just makes it very difficult uh, to know what to do and even to have a clear diagnosis. And so what you often will get is, you know, trying to get children who have some shared clinical problem and not too many complexities. Uh, and because of that, uh, while it helps in terms of the research design, uh, it also is some challenges. So we want to just acknowledge that. So then when you go into practice-wise and you're looking at, okay, how do I treat a kid with depression, you'll get sort of a, you know, practice guide on some steps that you could take. But there isn't a practice guide on, well, how do I deal with depression when we have this situation going on and this other situation? It would be just too complex to do that. So I think it's just important to acknowledge it. But the first question really in many ways is where do I even begin? Okay, next slide. So in addition to uh, the issues of complexity, there's also, gee, every time we get together, there's another problem going on. And, and it could seem like that's what therapy is. You know, every time we meet, it's, okay, how are things going this week? Oh, this, this happened this week. That was terrible and horrible. Then the next week, another different thing that happens. You know, people's lives can be, like, really very difficult, very chaotic. And there are things that are just emotionally upsetting and may come up. The problem, of course, uh, with, with this, have, you know, having to deal with different crises that come up during the week is it can really distract and derail from a focus on the clinical problem. So, so what is it? So the cows are the crises that arise between sessions, right? And that may again become the focus of your, uh, your session. Why it's important? It just may take up most or all the time in session, leaving little time for the implementation of, of your original plan. It may become the focus of most, if not all sessions, and it may involve situations that are not in the control of the caregiver, child, or practitioner. So you may have like these problems where there's this sense of, well, we just go from one problem to a different problem to another problem, and it begins to feel sort of dissatisfying, and it begins to get into this notion that that's what therapy is about, is, is identifying the problems that you have in the week. So that's just another issue to, to consider that makes the work complex. Okay, so what are some uh, examples of the cows in your work. When you think about uh, maybe what's in the last few weeks uh, with, the, with the youngsters that you've been working with, what kinds of problems have come up? 
that they that often can become now the focus of treatment and may not necessarily be related to what the focus of treatment is. So what kinds of things are you likely to, uh, to encounter? And if you have some thoughts on that, please uh, either raise your hand or you can just type in uh, your thoughts on the, in the chat box. Let's give you guys a moment. Again, what are some of those crises that typically you may find that it just sort of like comes up regularly in the work that you're doing? Okay, any thoughts on that? Okay, it may be a little bit. Uh, oh, we've got one. Academic uh, issues. Academic issues. Not doing homework, poor grades. Right. Break up with boyfriend or girlfriend, mm -hmm. legal concerns. Okay. Great. And great. Now, those are very common, and I'm sure we could generate many more. And so, okay, so what the, what, is, what to do? And maybe some would say, listen, Tony, that's, that's fine. People come in, they have, like, stuff that's going on during the week, and, uh, you know, they, they may need some help in how to manage some of these things. And also, it's, you know, it's something that it seems to be important. And so how do we deal with this this issue? Well, how to stay focused. And, and again, this is sort of an underlying principle in all evidence-based approaches. And the underlying principle is that treatment is most effective when it can stay focused. And that's really very similar to the idea of duration and dosage of an intervention. And that if it's too scattered, if you start out with one thing and then you jump to another thing, that you're less likely to have positive outcomes. So how to stay focused. First thing, you, have, you do have to assess the urgency of the situation. And folks mentioned that earlier mm -hmm. around the complexity. And you're absolutely right about that. The safety issues of the situation. So you don't just say, well, you know, forget about this because we, we, it's, not folk, it's not related to the, the treatment plan that we had. Obviously, urgency and safety issues take precedent over everything. But one strategy to stay focused is to look for a connection of the presenting issue to the primary clinical focus. So if it's schoolwork or folks, if it's somebody breaking up with a boyfriend or, or, or girlfriend, uh, if there are legal concerns, whatever it is that's coming up, one of the challenges uh, for the uh, practitioner in order to ensure that you're not getting too far away from the focus of treatment is to look for the connection of that whatever that crisis is to the primary clinical focus. So if somebody breaks up and they are feeling horrible about it and they begin to think that there's something wrong with them, that it's gonna be the end of the world, there's a lot of catastrophic thinking around it, and your treatment is around depression or anxiety, making that link is not gonna be so hard. And so that would be a way to say, here's just an example. This crisis is an example, a manifestation of the core problem that we're dealing with. And then you can begin to fold that into your approach around depression, which in this case might be a cognitive, you know, sort of approach. You know, that, you know, uh, some individuals, they just catastrophize a lot, or they begin to be self-blaming a lot, or they begin to blame others uh, and have sort of like this, you know, more of an aggressive uh, view of other people. I mean, it's all many, many different ways in which people's thinking about the things that happen to them in their lives can really be self-defeating and, and, and actually make things worse and, and feed into whatever the clinical problem is. So that's, that would make perfect sense to make that connection. But sometimes the crisis situation is not connected you know, to that problem. And, and then if you decide it's not urgent, it's not a, an issue like a, around safety and all, then the challenge is how do I redirect in a very respectful and a very kind way Around and the reason for redirecting to uh, the focus of the uh, of the plan itself. Okay, let's next explain. Okay, so cows may be addressed and acknowledged in a respectful and empathic manner. The challenge is to avoid the herd of cows that may begin to dominate the treatment process without resolution, and then it just may feel kind of dissatisfying to everybody that you know it's just basically a 
kind of a moaning and groaning session, uh, rather than this is really meant to systematically and thoughtfully assist the person address the core problem. You may also want to establish the purpose and focus of treatment from the very, very beginning. Anticipate cows and how they'll be handled. So letting folks know that from the very beginning. You know, look, there are going to be things that are coming up. We're going to always look for when those things come up that are really related to why we're here. But there may be some issues that come up that I just want to kind of, you know, we have to, both of us need to look out for whether or not it's going to kind of take us off track or keep us on track. And that shouldn't come as a surprise. So that's part of good psychoeducation in terms of what's the point of, of treatment, what are we trying to accomplish here. And for many people and caregivers and children, it's kind of know what's their role in participating and making this, this really work for them. And then provide a rationale for the importance, okay? Focus uh, on, on the issue. Now, one of the issues around cows really comes down to the issue of coping. And it's important to make the distinction. Uh, and because sometimes practitioners may lose sight of this, but coping is really in two major categories. Some forms of coping are really uh, best, uh, uh, some forms, some cows rather, uh, can best be addressed uh, through a actual problem focused coping. It means the crisis is definable and you could address it by employing problem solving strategies. And the practice guide on problem solving, which we'll get to in a little while, may be really helpful in this, a situation that you judge needs to be addressed. But not all problems and crises that come up are really in under anyone's control. So you're not under the child's control or caregiver control. Then you're left with emotion-focused coping. Is that how do you deal with distress? You just can't get rid of it. You can't relieve it. You can't change the situation. You can't problem solve it away. So when the situation is beyond the direct control of the caregiver and child, upsetting feelings and stressful life events are really addressed by engaging in emotion-focused coping. And a lot of that is really to relieve the distress associated with this, but to ensure that you use coping that not only works in the short run, but isn't going to cause you problems in the long run. So a coping uh, to deal with like upsetting feelings by, you know, drinking uh, heavily, uh, while that may experience, in person may experience some relief, right, in the short run, but may cause problems in the long run. So it's sort of like important to make that distinction, because if you're in an emotion-focused coping, but you approach it from a problem-solving perspective, you can really find yourself putting a lot of energy into time to something that's not going to work out. Okay, so that's just a, I think it's a, a good concept to sort of keep in mind when you're dealing with various problems that pop up in the kid's life. So what good can help the practitioner and the child and caregiver stay on track? That treatment plan a worksheet, uh, using it from day one, because, it, again, it begins to structure. It's something you could share with the caregiver uh, and the child. That, hey, you know, we, have a wrote, we wrote out a plan for ourselves, and here it is. Uh, use the practice-wise system on day one and throughout the treatment process so that you really have some ideas of how to intervene. Uh, use the session planner so that in each session you have at least go in there with a plan that you could share with a caregiver and, and, the, uh, and the child as opposed to starting a session with, so how is how things going? And how are things going is a perfect invitation for a cow. So that I think is, you know, maybe an important thing to consider. And then using the dashboard uh, in, a, in a way, and the dashboard is nothing more than we've identified what our goals are. We've identified the areas that we want to see improve and using that from day one. All of this helps everybody to stay on track. Okay, here's just sort of an example. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. Uh, where your entire, you know, sort of like treatment includes the uh, engagement, rapport building, explaining to the family what the clinical problem is and what treatment's about. And the middle is really when you draw a lot on those practice guides. Um, there's practice guides throughout all of these things, but the middle is, okay, now we're going to really deliver the treatment and the strategy. Uh, and then, of course, the end of almost all programs is how do I ensure that this sticks, right, that they're able to kind of you know, keep this going, keep whatever gains have been accomplished to kind of keep that, uh, keep that going and prevent relapse. So an example would be working on depressed mood, using strategies to increase positive feelings and behavior. Uh, but the other stressor makes this more complex would be mom and dad who are arguing lately, and that's a stressor for the kid. Uh, and in, in many questions, it could be a question, is this a problem-focused kind of approach? I mean, you certainly as a therapist can bring up and suggest to mom and dad that they get involved in 
uh, in counseling to sort of like begin to address that kind of a thing. But if they, you know, are not into that or the mom and dad are separate and are unlikely to really engage in that, uh, you may be the one going out to try to solve this problem, at least in terms of minimizing its impact on the, on the child. Uh, but it may not be like, well, I'm going to start doing couples therapy now. So in many ways, you might go to more of a fo motion-focused coping. So how does this kid not blame themselves for it? You know, how, what kinds of steps can they take so that they're less distressed by what's going on in their uh, parents' lives? Here's just, again, this is just an example of the session planning. You guys have seen this before. Let's go on. Uh, now, okay, so here's, here's really what the treat is for today. Uh, having one of your colleagues, Melissa in, uh, in Gino from Pettison Craig Center, mm -hmm. she volunteered uh, to share her dashboard. And uh, so thank you, Mel Melissa. I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, and and this, I'm really looking forward to this, this part of the presentation so we can see how an actual um, practitioner has used this system, including the uh, dashboard. No Thanks, problem. Melissa. Thanks so much, Tony. So, Carrie, you pulled up um, your desktop, right? Yes. Okay, wonderful. It? Great. Yep. Um, so you'll see, you know, what I'm going to do with you guys is kind of just walk through the different elements of my dashboard um, and just share with you how, you know, I've been able to incorporate this um, with my treatment um, with one of my little peanuts. That's what I call them. <laughs> so, um, so what we have on the first page is just, you know, the typical data and client info. Um, so I just gave him his case ID. Um, it is a male. He is Hispanic. Um, he's about five and a half years old. And then you'll see the diagnoses um, on this page. Now, it just it's really funny how today's dashboard is all about, or today's um, webinar is all about um, complexity. And you'll see just with his diagnosis, he has a mood disorder as well as some inattention and hyperactivity. So. Um, what you'll see is with the practices and also, um, you know, my measures, you'll see that I try to address both of those complex issues. So Kara pulled up um, the measures. So the different columns that I have here, the first one, of course, is the standardized um, questionnaire. Now, I used the RCADS P, which is for the parents. Um, I tried a few other questionnaires with... Um, with my client, but it didn't work out too well, especially because of his age. So I think a really great way to quantify what was going on was to use a, you know, a kind of a parental version of the RCADs. So you'll see, just so I can explain this, you know, of course, the higher the score, um, you know, the more depressive and anxiety symptoms that are present. And you'll see that over time, um, and if, you know, Kara was to go a little bit more to the left, you would see, see all the dates. So those are all the times that I saw them um, for a family session. So every few weeks, I'll have mom complete the questionnaire. So you'll see the first week, he was at a 63. Um, the, fo the following two weeks, 25. And you're, you're seeing that it's slowly going down, which is so great. Um, and so you'll see... You know, the next four columns are the different progress measures that I identified. The first one, I have crying spells. The second, suicidal statements. The third one, self-harmful behaviors. And the fourth one, you can't really see it, but it says stickers obtained and positive behaviors. So, I mean, you'll see especially when we get to the whole results page, but even if you just look numerically at the numbers, it's starting to go down. Um, in terms of the negative behaviors like crying spells, suicidal statements, and self-harmful behaviors. And the positive behaviors and stickers obtained is actually going up, which is a great thing. Um, and just to make note before we go to the, the practices, the self-harmful behaviors that my client, because that's a very <laughs> broad category, um, the self-harmful behaviors my client would usually engage in is like, you know, ripping out his hair, slamming his body or head against the wall. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I noted that to you guys. Um, so I guess we'll go to the practice page. Okay. So what you you guys are going to see, especially when we go to the results, is that I have a lot of different interventions during each therapy session. <laughs> 
some of them are very consistent throughout, but there's usually at least more than three per session. Now, you know, one thing that Tony mentioned to me, which I think is really important for me to share with you guys, is that even if you you guys just use one practice guide or practice element, that's okay. Um, you know, for me, I took like little pieces and little elements of the different practice guides um, and the different practices that you see here. So, you know, one thing I always say to my clients is you need to work what works for you. And for me, you know, kind of wearing a different hat for different times in the session is what I did. So that's why you guys see you know, so many different interventions. But if your dashboard doesn't look like this, that's okay too. Like I said, you need to work what works. So I guess we'll look at the results page. So what you'll guys see up top is that, you know, the line graph that does, you know, reflect what we saw in the measures. So like, for example, let's just look at the RCADs, which is in blue. Um, you know, remember that 63, that's where we first started out and we're seeing it's going lower and lower and lower. Um, and, I mean, that's pretty consistent with the crying spells, too, the suicidal statements, and the self-harmful behaviors in general. Um, he had a little bit of a blip <laughs> one of the weeks, but he's doing much better now. And then you'll see, um, you know, with the black line, the stickers obtained and positive behaviors has increased dramatically over the past few weeks. Um, just to let you guys know, I've implemented kind of a you know, a behavior, I guess, chart, you could say. I used a lot of rewards and consequences with him, um, as well as engaging mom in this. And mom's never done this with him before. So that's improved a lot of his, you know, his behaviors because of that. So I think, you know, the other piece is that having parent and family involvement, which is unfortunately very rare sometimes, really does help. Um, and then, of course, the bottom, you guys see all the practices that were utilized, you know, during the sessions. But you see a lot of them is very consistent, you know, um, like monitoring, praise, problem solving, relationship building, um, reinforcement, active ignoring, engagement with child and caregiver. Um, but just to let you guys know, kind of before I give it back to Tony, is that you know, kind of my dashboard approach, because it's really hard if you're, you know, not do if you're doing this on your own, you have all this other paperwork to do. It's really, it's really hard to, you know, especially with time management, trying to figure out when you're going to do all of this. My approach with my clients, whether it's for documentation for my agency or this type of documentation, is I do it collaboratively with my client and also his mom. So, and that's a way to also kind of steer clear of cows right away <laughs> um, because I do want to stay focused and that's how I do it. Like as soon as they come in, I pull up my dashboard and that's how we check in with each other. So that's kind of my approach. I hope, you know, this can help you guys out. If you have any questions, <laughs> please let me know. But, um, but yeah, that's my dashboard so far. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. This is wonderful. Yeah, no this, problem. Um, I, I think that um, I'm really just going to invite folks to, to ask Melissa some questions around this, because this is really one of the challenge areas, as Melissa mm -hmm. mentioned, in terms yeah. of how do you do this in a way that's practical, that's, um, you know, good time management. Uh, and you discussed one strategy, Melissa, that you use, which is really like sort of a collaborative or concurrent. Yeah. Use of it. And it sounds like you start off with the, the session, but I'm sure some of the folks out there have some questions. So I'm just mm -hmm. going to step back a little bit and, and really get, ask you guys to reflect on a question that you might want to ask Melissa, because uh, you know people are, do struggle with the um, you know with the dashboard. Absolutely. So let's, just, let's just do that. Um, if people can either raise their hand or um, chat or, or the, type chat in the chat box, box. even. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Send to all panelists. When you chat, if you can chat your questions mm -hmm. in the chat box, please click uh, "Send to all panelists." Thank you. 
And Mike just told Melissa she did an awesome job. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of questions in case anyone else doesn't. But I, was, I just want folks to uh, get a chance, like, be asking, how, Melissa, how'd you pull this off? <laughs> <Basically>. <laughs> I think that's so, what it was, though, you know, just really doing it collaboratively with them. All right, so let's 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 kind of go through this in a little more detail. Sounds so I good. show up. It's the the caregiver comes with the five and a half year old, correct? Yeah. Okay. So um, I show up, and I have my five and a half year old boy with me, mm -hmm. um, and we say hi, how you doing? You know, we kind of sit down. So, at what point do you kind of in, you know how do you start? How do you actually begin to even introduce the idea of the dashboard with to me? Well, this is the thing. When I when I first went to the training with you guys in the city, that was right after I finished my intake with them. So literally from the first family session we had, you know, I introduced them, you know, as an agency. We're a part of this new learning collaborative. It's also a way to kind of, you know, mark progress and evaluate certain measures. And I think this will be a really good way. How I packaged it was this is going to be a really good way for us to keep track and stay on task because he has a lot of stuff going on and it could get a little, you know, mixed up in the shuffle. And I think, you know, you guys need the most effective type of treatment. And I think this will help us kind of really focus on what we need to, to improve on, you know. Um, so, you know, I gave all that information to mom. I mean, the kid, he... He didn't really understand fully what was going on, but mom was definitely on board. And I told her from the beginning, when we check in every week or every few weeks, we're going to do this questionnaire together. But every week, we're going to check in on these different measures that we're going to come up with today. So basically, you had to communicate for buy-in. Yeah. You, you had to get mom of course. To, into this, <laughs> so into this process. That that's because you know, who knows what the, her expectations might have been. Right. Or if she had any previous experience in in uh, in treatment. Well, that was the so thing too. He's never been in. He's only five and a half. He's never been. He's never been in treatment before. Right. Right. So this is a so really you, great way to put kind of you know, you know, a really good good take on what treatment's about, and it should be about evaluating and marking progress. Right. Right. So. You know. uh, Part of it is, and maybe this is something for folks to consider as we go forward in our additional, uh, you know, uh, quarters, uh, upcoming one on anxiety. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you say, Melissa, that uh, starting with a new, a new client is, is and, and then a, really explaining this and using this from really day one would be a, mm -hmm. uh, a good idea? I. I think so, but I but on the other hand, like my colleague, he's used this for a client he's already had, and it's been effective. So I think it's a case by case scenario, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I know with my client, I, I, they kind of knew what to expect. They learned the culture of my sessions and how this collaborative documentation fits like a puzzle piece right. into it. So I think from the beginning, it's something that they've gotten used to and they don't know anything else. So it's hard right. to say. <laughs> yeah. so, um, it sounds like there are some real advantages if you, from the very beginning, to definitely uh, begin to establish what this treatment is really about. But, it's, it, but if you don't, if you want to introduce it somewhere in the middle of treatment, you can still do that. Uh, right. And that can still, can still work. But uh, getting the buy-in is very important. And then the other piece you mentioned uh, is um, building this into the session. It isn't something you do, you know, have to do before or, or after the session, but it's built into the time during the session. Is that accurate? Yes, absolutely. So the first five minutes, we're looking at the dashboard, um, at least five minutes. And if we need to, you know, check in with other stuff that maybe we forgot, you know, of course, during, you know, the wrap-up or conclusion, you know, conclusion of the session, we would do that as well. Okay. Okay. And any other benefits that you find uh, in your work, Melissa, uh, in using this type of um, practice-wise and, and dashboard and practice guides? Uh, what, what does it mean for, for you as a practitioner to have this resource? Because ultimately, mm -hmm. that's the critical question that we have around this whole project. 
So could you just uh, share what, what, what it means to you as a, as a professional to have this resource available? Absolutely. I mean, in terms of the practice guides, I mean, it's it's just a nice summary of all the treatment planners I have. <laughs> all in, It's like a one-stop shop. So that's been very helpful. I mean, even with, you know, um, you know, searching, you know, the, the P-webs, that's very helpful, too, to kind of guide my practice, you know, from the beginning. But really, the dashboard, for me, at least, has been the most helpful, because it helps quantify and see, you know, how my client's doing. It's all about, you know, results and evaluation. And, I mean, every three months as, as a clinic, we have to look at how they're doing. But this is just a nice way to cohesively put all the pieces together, all the measures together, and then even show the client and the parent, like, hey, you're saying he's not doing too good. He, You know, he really hasn't gotten that much out of treatment, but our results show otherwise, you know, so right. it's a way to kind of address that, too, if that ever comes up. Now, I think the very, very important point, Melissa, is that sometimes the perception of the child, the caregiver, and the clinician yep. in being able to judge whether there's been progress or whether things have gotten stuck or whether things are going, you know, getting a little worse, uh, that uh, one's perceptions don't necessarily always align with the reality. And right. so here you have like sort of an objective measure. I think the, the piece that is very important is that having some specific goal areas mm -hmm. and monitoring the progress over time, it sounds like for you that w is a very important part of an effective treatment strategy. Yes, absolutely. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. This has really been, uh, you know, <laughs> the rest of the program I'm going to be speaking, but uh, I think the highlight has been your presentation. So thanks very much. Not a problem. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, you know, we we talk about therapeutic alliance, and in many ways, the question is in in terms of buy-in around the dashboard and how we're going to have how's treatment going to be, um, that having that kind of buy-in is part of the therapeutic alliance, right? Having a shared understanding that we make decisions together, we have to decide on what are some of the outcomes that are really uh, valuable and important. And uh, and having you know and ha how do you form and strengthen the relationship with the therapist? You guys know this that this is like really critical, but that the use of the dashboard and some of these practice and I know some uh, of the participants uh, for some of the practice guys may actually make copies and gave it to the to the caregiver, and again that also begins to sort of strengthen relationship because it has transparency to it, and transparency tends to be something that does promote trust uh, and and confidence. Okay, next slide. Uh, so let's let's look at a couple of common elements. Uh, this is something you guys I know can do very much on your own. But just again to to kind of emphasize, you know, what what's this whole practice web piece really about? And as you can see, for each practice area, in this case it's depression. But when we get into anxiety or conduct problems uh, or the areas of trauma, or if we would go into ADHD and all those kinds of things, when you compile the research, you might get a different sequence, right? of practices, uh, that the most common for trauma may be something else or for conduct problems. But for depression, cognitive, and cognitive tends to be pretty high in a lot of uh, uh, programs, uh, but we went through cognitive, and uh, we're gonna, today we're going to focus on a couple we hadn't. So what did we do in previous webinars? We did the CBT, and that was really is like the way people think about their lives affects both their feelings and the actions that they take. And if you have really, if you're thinking in irrational or self-defeating ways, you got to address it. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to be able to get to the next step uh, as long as people are perceiving things in a, in a way that's uh, distorted. The other is psychoeducation and in, in informing and engaging the child and caregiver about depression or whatever the clinical problem is, you know, what it is, why it's important, and the focus, the structure, the content, and the process of, uh, of treatment. In Melissa's case, she, she establishes that one of the things that we do in treatment is we monitor progress, which also strengthens self-monitoring, uh, and but that we want to have some objective measures to have a, a sense of are we going in the right direction or wrong direction. In medical practice, this is very similar to um, my cardiologist kind of laying out for me what my, my numbers are in terms of cholesterol and in terms of triglyceride or in terms of blood pressure. And in a way, it's the same kind of idea, is how do we know if you're stuck, 
getting worse or things are, are getting better. And the idea of getting that feedback is it can be a very important part of motivating clients. Let's just go back one more. Just uh, Okay. The other piece was activity schedule you went through is how do you guide a child to increase or re-engage in mood-improving activities and then self-monitoring um, and establishing that those goals align really with what's important to the child and caregiver. Okay, well, well we're going to go look at today, uh, really, and again, you know, since you guys have the practice guides and the feedback we've been getting on our individual calls, the folks know how to use the practice guides, use the practice guides regularly, uh, but we just wanted to, again, you know, uh, address a number of them that are pretty high on the frequency of their use in the research on depression with kids. So problem solving, goal setting, maintenance, next. So problem solving, right? Uh, and this is something you may actually want to apply to a cow. If your judgment is that this particular stressor that's being reported uh, can be the focus of, of, a, of a problem solving strategy, and that's one way of kind of helping uh, folks address that, and particularly if it's very closely related to the reason why this child is in treatment in the first place, then you can certainly use it. But otherwise, around depression, anxiety, problem solving is, is typically an important piece. And how do you actually help somebody to think in a in very thoughtful way, in a, a strategic way, about solving problems? People go about solving problems in all sorts of ways, oftentimes completely ineffective. You can make a really big difference in the lives of, of these uh, families uh, when you help them to kind of think through problems in a step-by-step -step way. And next. Um, so you, you, there are five steps. You'll see this in the practice guide. I'm sure you've been exposed to this idea, right? Of what, what is this problem? What are generating solutions, examining the ups and, up, upside and downside of each solution. Pick one, try it out, and see how it works. It shouldn't be a very, very complex thing. You don't want 32 steps uh, and something that's really straightforward. Uh, and then a, it's really applying it to a, a, a problem that's well-defined. The biggest issue here is uh, the way in which the problem is actually phrased and how you describe and understand the nature of the problem. Once you've gotten that down, then applying the rest of the steps is not so hard. Uh, okay, next. Um, actually, I'm just thinking of the time. So, uh, you know, you could, um, is, okay, so the overview of uh, solving problems is easy if you think through many possible uh, solutions. So the previous slide was just sort of like thinking of a case, but uh, we really don't have time, uh, you know, to do that. Uh, and why use this problem-solving approach? And basically, you know, you guys know pretty much why this is important, all right? Um, and, and, and actually, when people do solve problems effectively, that strengthens their confidence in being able to address additional problems. This notion of self-efficacy, that you are capable of dealing with problems rather than just feeling overwhelmed, and that is a critically important thing. Uh, and helping individuals to break things down into its steps, understanding and defining what the problem is, because people often mislabel the problem. If you mislabel it, then forget it. It's all over because you're not sure if, which, if you mislabel it, then you're going to be working on your perception of a problem that really is, doesn't align with reality. So, uh, again, the guides will help you through this. Uh, this ought to be a skill that every practitioner has. I mean, if we're in helping profession, knowing how to assist people in terms of solving problems, and especially that first step of being able, how do you conceptualize and define the problem, and then the, the other steps will, will kind of flow naturally from that. So again, this is just part of the practice guide. Uh, folks have been telling us that they use, it pretty, they use these guides pretty frequently and find them useful, and again, you have access to them, and that's the whole point of the, the whole pra practice-wise approach. And, and then you have, of course, um, well, this is pretty self-evident. Let's go on to goal setting. So part of it, so you have some problem solving, but dealing with problems is not the same as achieving things that are important in your life. So goal setting is incredibly important, and I think it's very inextricably linked to what I think Melissa was bringing up. The use of the dashboard, it isn't for research purposes. The use of the dashboard is to establish some shared goals that we want to see improve so that we can answer the question, so that this treatment amount to much? So that if, some, if a relative asks the caregiver, so you went to those uh, people over there in that clinic, what did they do for you? Well, how did this help? And, and goal setting helps to ensure that you're really aligned with what's important to uh, the child and or uh, the caregiver. Okay, next. Uh, so, you know, how do you do this? 
describing the, the benefits of goal setting, identify some goals, prioritize goals. You know, goals, this, this whole area of goal setting, um, it's, not, it's not so easy uh, helping, uh, you know, both uh, the child and or caregiver establish like sort of w what direction, what, what is it that's really important to you? It's a very important motivation strategy to know what's personally meaningful uh, and then being able to see how the treatment and commitment to treatment is going to uh, help in the service of that goal. And the, and the practice guide will give you some tips on how to explain this and how to approach this. Uh, and part of it is just breaking things down into small steps. Probably that's the most, one of the most important issues is if you just try to bite off a lot more than you really can chew, it'll be very dissatisfying and you'll be less likely to move into goals in the future. Okay, and the last piece, which again, you guys can, uh, can take a look. Let's just go to maintenance uh, next. And, 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 and you, you know what this is about. You know, and we know this is a challenge. Uh, while they have your support and you're able to kind of monitor things, uh, and, but once you're not in the picture as much, right, or folks get discharged, to think about, okay, if you're not coming in here every week, how are you going to maintain some of the, the gains that you, you know, that you made? And so that's a, a very important, you know, part of it. And that's not something you just do at the end. You build in maintenance really throughout the entire, uh, the entire process. Uh, how does one sustain the gains? And you, and you do that by ensuring uh, that you're strengthening the capacity of both the child and the caregiver uh, to do things differently uh, and to get feedback on what they're doing differently and to give them a chance to continue to, to practice that. And again, here are some of the steps. All right, you can review some of the basic concepts. And here's, here's the practice-wise piece. This is why you have that resource. We don't need to go through that uh, in detail now. So, um, okay, if there are any uh, sort of last minute kind of questions, we're just about out of time. Uh, but again, you can, uh, you know, you can always email us if there's anything else that comes up. Uh, but the next steps, um, we are finishing up our depression piece. Some of, some of the folks that have been involved in this have done just an incredible job around the whole use of this, you know, in the way that Melissa has and, and the other folks at Pettis and Craig Others have really struggled. Um, and again, we don't see this as a race. We are completely non-judgmental. Uh, if you've really had some challenges when it came to the depression, the quarter that we focused on depression, we will have like another quarter. And we hope to be a support to you and see if you can apply this to anxiety. And we may find that for some organizations, applying it to anxiety is gonna be something that they're gonna be more likely to be able to do than looking at the depression. Uh, we won't know that. We're going to try to check that out. We will have uh, uh, webinars coming up on September 10th, uh, and you can just see what the schedule is here. We'll get that out to everyone. We're going to have a series of three webinars on anxiety. So we hope that part of this PEDS pro project is just giving you some updated information on uh, treatment strategies for, uh, for youngsters and adolescents with, uh, with anxiety. Okay, so uh, this is our contact information. And anytime you want to reach reach us, uh, please feel free. And again, we want to just thank you all for being part of this project. You're contributing to some major decisions that the Office of Mental Health will make regarding uh, this whole practice-wide system and the policies regarding disseminating this uh, perhaps uh, throughout the state, as well as how we need to adapt this so that it's going to be most useful uh, for all of you and useful for the children and the, uh, the caregivers that you work with. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a very good day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye now. Bye.